Dr. Spencer, Dr. McCarthy, Dr. Siegel, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this round table debate being held here in Boston uh, in parallel to the uh, International Maloma Workshop 2019. Uh, transplant is really a hot topic in Maloma uh, these days because, you know, every other year we try to question the role of transplant in Maloma uh, thanks to the advent of uh, new wonderful drugs. So I'd like to know your thoughts these days. Uh, is there still a role for transplant? A bit provocative question, uh, frontline for every transplant eligible patient? Uh, I think we, we, uh, we, we should never cheat the patients out of the opportunity to be cured. And the only thing that has ever made myeloma go away and, and stay away is, is high dose melphalan. And, and you know, we, we have data going back to the 1980s that suggests that 10% of uh, patients will be in continued remission at, at 20 years. And for a disease that has a median uh, age at uh, diagnosis, at least in the United States, of around 70, if you're going to stay in a complete remission for, for 20 years, you, you're, you're not going to die for, from, from myeloma. So why would we ever cheat the patient out of the opportunity to be those uh, lucky few? But you pronounce the word cure, and actually I hear everywhere in our meetings that it's an uncurable disease. So. Right. You believe that thanks to transplant, we are able to cure a small proportion of these patients? Well, I mean, cure can mean many different things. So cure can mean that the disease is gone and no matter how hard you search for it, uh, it, 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 it isn't there anymore. This could be Hodgkin's disease. This could be you know, any number of diseases that, that the, the biology is such that you can uh, eliminate every last clonal cell. So there may be patients that, that we, we achieve that. It's by accident, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is, if the disease doesn't come back for 20 years and your life expectancy is substantially less than that, uh, you, you're cured functionally, if not biologically. So living long and well. Yes. Dr. McCarthy, do you share this opinion? A little uh, nuance different. Um, I, I don't ascribe to the cure. Uh, having had patients 15 years out from their stem cell transplant relapse and require more therapy, but having a long period of time without disease progression. So I do agree with David that there are patients who, uh, who do well. We just don't know who, who they are yet. Someday we will. I do think melphalan, though, in high dose, I completely agree, is part of the armamentarium that we need to use for our patients. And as you say, every year transplant is dead, is, is declared, and yet we find studies, for example, the Forte trial, which some people spin as, oh, this shows that you don't need transplant. And I would disagree and say, no, I think you do, especially for high-risk disease and for high-burden disease, at least now when you compare it to chemotherapy. So you're alluding to the 40 multicenter Italian trial yes. comparing KRD for one year versus KRD induction uh, followed by transplant. Yes, because in that study, you're able to show first that the MRD rates are much higher in the transplant arm and that the progression, in other words, the relapse rate is higher in those who are, are ISS twos and threes. So right away we know in an early readout that we're seeing that transplant at least is superior in terms of relapse and MRD negativity. We're gonna need longer follow-up for the RISS once uh, to see if this holds up because the, the numbers are too small. And we're gonna see this in a lot of other studies where you're gonna have to wait five, 10 years for a readout which is a good problem for our patients. It's tough on the investigators. <laughs> but, but, but I do think we're gonna see that. We'll probably see this with the Cassiopeia and Perseus trials as well. We're gonna to have to wait a very long time for a readout. And again, good problem, but it makes it more difficult for us to figure it out. So I think like today we saw the um, MRD uh, testing from the Cassiopeia trial, very interesting. Compared. So you are a believer in MRD as a surrogate marker no, not yet, okay. <laughs> but I think it's interesting. 
Okay. In other words, it tells you depth of response. So I, I can't say for sure, uh, but I think it's provocative. I think, I know David has talked in, uh, in the past at other sessions about immune profiling. I completely agree. I think we need to, we have not a clue about the microenvironment. We're beginning to understand it. Uh, and I know Andrew is doing some really interesting work on immune profiling and understanding the immune system of the patient with regards to disease control. So Andrew, how things are going in Australia? Are you still transplanting everybody? Yeah, look, I think the uh, clinical utility of transplantation is rock solid in Australia. And I think that the notion that people wouldn't be transplanted will be driven really by the jurisdiction in which patients are being treated. Um, we see uh, data from clinical trials questioning the role of transplantation but conversely, the ability to access and deliver those drugs which question transplantation is severely limited in some parts of the world. So where I work, um, the cost effectiveness, if nothing else, of transplantation puts it at the top of the list of what you do. Because in reality, uh, we can do an autograph for 20,000 Australian dollars, which is a couple of months worth of lenalidomide. So, you know, there's no way uh, I can see in the medium term that transplantation will be challenged, at least in my jurisdiction. It's highly effective. Uh, there's a brief period of unwellness, but generally it's well tolerated. The mortality rate is very low. Um, and I think it, it's a great way to control the disease and extend survival. Okay, let me actually ask the same question, but in a more subtle way. It looks like that we're all in agreement I'm a believer also, although I'm trying to be the devil advocate today in this uh, debate. Uh, we're in agreement that transplant is really a reasonable and good option. But the subtle thing, do we need it frontline immediately to everybody or can it be delayed? Well, in the studies that have utilized a delayed transplant strategy, one of the things that has always worried me is that a substantial fraction of patients never get the transplant. Okay, we, we, we lose <clears throat> some of them. Yeah, and I, I think that is really inappropriate uh, because it means that they're not subject to a, a life prolonging intervention because of a question being asked. And I don't agree with that. I think that um, as far as our standard clinical practice goes, we would use it as part of frontline therapy same opinion on the East Coast? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a funny question. I think that if transplant was never given the name transplant, that we called this dose intense therapy with stem cell rescue, we would never have any of these conversations. It would be a very fancy semantic. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the reality of it is a big part of why we do the transplant is about winning that lottery ticket. That, uh, that I talked about before, being one of these people who have extraordinarily long remissions. Uh, but, but the other part of it is that the best time that patients have in the entire course of their, of their therapy is, is that sort of treatment-free interval. And, and this is true whether, whether you believe in maintenance therapy or don't believe in maintenance therapy. There is a, an extended period of time in which the patients are not getting rigorous therapy. And, and so th this, this period of time can be a year, but more typically you know, two, three, four years, and with maintenance therapy, four, five, six years, and for the lucky few, it is measured in decades. And let, let me be the patient voice, yeah. because you mentioned the patient. Okay, uh, a patient is telling you, oh, this is great, doc, and I mean, I trust you, but I went to uh, Google, you know, and I read actually, with or without transplant, survival is the same at the end of the day. Because, you know, patients are not really reading progression-free survival. They look into survival. That's the most important. Then uh, the same patient has read somewhere that actually Dr. McCarthy mentioned uh, MRD, and everybody's excited about uh, MRD. Well, if you achieve negative MRD deep response, who cares about how do you achieve this? You're gonna live long enough. What would you tell this patient? Well, 
I think you can look at the IFM 2009 did and show that uh, those patients who are in the RVD arm, the chemotherapy arm, if, uh, even if they became negative, there still was a subtle difference with those who received transplant, but they were small numbers, and those who were positive obviously had a huge difference in terms of the response to transplant versus continued chemotherapy. And I think you, as uh, David pointed out, you have to think of it in terms of time without treatment. And the one thing that transplant really treatment does Treatment-free interval, you mean? The treatment-free interval, or, and again, excluding maintenance, because I, mean, I don't consider maintenance treatment. And I'm thinking of more aggressive treatment to salvage uh, progressive disease, and you don't see that with transplant uh, as you have a longer interval than you do with chemotherapy. I do think we have to wait longer for an overall survival readout. The other problem with an overall survival readout is that we're not treating pancreas cancer, where that's really an important item. And that overall survival is very difficult to read out when you have a situation where you have multiple options to salvage patients. These are good problems to have uh, for the patient. It makes it tougher on the investigator because you're now trying to figure out how do I put together a regimen so that I can salvage them uh, appropriately uh, if they've already had prior chemotherapy. And I may not miss, as both David and Andrew have said, I may miss the opportunity to give them a transplant because their disease has progressed too fast. And until I have a biomarker or a diagnostic criterion to tell me, ah, oh, this is the patient who, who I can salvage with the transplant, we, I, can't, I don't think we can say that yet. But, but you, you, this, this all started with the question of should we be doing it up front or otherwise? Yeah. And you know, again, it's all about treatment-free interval. And again, maintenance or no maintenance, this answer is exactly the same. There is no one who would debate that your interval is going to be longer if you get the transplant as part of your initial therapy. And there are patients out there with remissions that are being measured in multiple decades. Um, uh, you know, I, I've had patients who I transplanted when I was still in Arkansas, so they are out, you know, 20 plus years and have not had any therapy in, in, in all of that time.